Are you a diver and you maybe even take photos or videos underwater? Then this live stream is for you. Because we believe that everyone who takes images underwater is already an ocean ambassador. And to make sure that you can do your job properly and inspire people out there to care for the ocean and eventually protect it, we collected your questions beforehand on social media and we're going to ask those questions to creative professionals from the industry. And we are sending live from the world's largest water sports show here in Düsseldorf, the boat show, which is taking place from 18th to 26th of January. You're going to find us live in Hall 11 at the Pixel World workshop stage. Make sure you follow us on social media, on the Behind the Mask Facebook page and on the Behind the Mask YouTube channel. Turn on your notifications and most importantly, ask your questions down in the comments and maybe we will even be able to pick up your question and forward your question to our guest. And one more thing, by leaving us a comment, you already have a chance to win amazing prizes. Hey everyone, 11, 15, 16, we're almost on time with a very special guest, Inka Creswell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, huge following here on the stage. <laughs> if you want to yeah. see her and talk to her, then uh, come tomorrow evening to our party right here. You know, I think this is a really cool talk because you are outstanding because most of the guests that we have here, everybody except you, is basically in the middle or the end of their career. They're like super professional people doing amazing things and you always kind of wonder how do you actually get to do that and how do you start with it? And then sometimes, you know, the, the answers that we got from Mornay or Andy is always like, yeah, I don't know how it happened. It just happened. I was at the right time, at the right place. Yeah. Somebody gave me a camera and then I push a button and all of a sudden I'm on BBC and National Geographic. But there's a lot of people out there who think, hmm, if I can be, you know, what can I do? How can I start? And there's always a connection between underwater filmmaking and photography and marine biology. And she is a girl. I didn't know this. <laughs> And she's a girl. <laughs> you mean there's not so many girls doing that? Yeah, we, we need more representation. Inka, what do you I think? What is, the, what is the reason <laughs> that not so many girls are in this field? I think it's a mix of things. Um, definitely there's still a huge lack of girls that are in this industry. And I think a part of that is a lack of female role models in this industry. I think just going out on dive boats, a lot of the expeditions I've been on, it's not uncommon to be the only girl on that team. And I think for a lot of girls that makes them uncomfortable and puts them off quite early on. And I've been really lucky to have a lot of really strong male role, role models in my life who have acted as mentors, educating, sharing their passion, teaching me how to do things. So I've never felt uncomfortable being on a dive boat that's full of guys and never let that put me off from doing what I'm doing. So. I think a lot of girls get put off early on by just seeing a lot of men in a male-oriented industry and then just thinking, oh, that's not for me, when in fact it could be. And then uh, there's another uh, thing that a lot of people think is you can't really make a living with it. You know, marine biology is probably not, I mean, it's not economics, uh, it's not the big money yeah. uh, thing. So I think maybe also a lot of people are afraid yeah that if they follow their heart and passion, that in the end, they're going to sit there, nothing to eat, lonely. Yeah, it's true. You know, I don't know. How is it so far? <laughs> Definitely not lonely. Um, I do agree with the lack of making a good amount of money. But I think for me, I've always been so passionate about the oceans and so passionate about diving and loved having those experiences. So I've always figured that even if I did do a higher paying job, like, I don't know, being an accountant or something like that, I would only be spending all of my money to be able to then go dive in my spare time. So why not just dive every day and just take that as a whim? How old are you? 25. 25. Whoa. And you still live with your parents? No, I don't. Oh. I have a little flat, just moved in a week ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's a really cool little flat. And then before that, I was living on a boat for a while. 
And then before that, like a little hut in Indonesia. So <laughs> I haven't lived with my parents in a while, um, but I've always had kind of alternative accommodation. So this is my first proper adult flat. <laughs> okay, so here's the proof. You can have your own flat even, <laughs> yeah. even uh, doing this. You've been talking about role models. Yeah. What was the most important, important role model or, or support that you get uh, to actually be able to make a decision? Yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I go and make conservation filmmaking my profession. It was actually a talk at the London International Dive Show when I was about 12, 13, and I went with my dad and I sat in on one of Andrea Marshall's <coughs> talks, and I remember sitting in the audience and being like, oh my God, this is a girl and she's a marine biologist, and being so inspired, and then going and talking to her after and her being like, oh yeah, let me know when you're this age and blah, 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 and sometimes there's opportunities to come and join trips, and I just left just so inspired by her. And she obviously uses photography and media a lot in the way that she does things. And I just remember seeing what she'd done and what she'd been able to achieve and being so inspired. Before we look a little bit closer uh, on how the steps are that you took you know, to progress uh, in everything, was, like, what was the biggest obstacle? Was there like, you know, the grandma situation? We go like, come on, Inka, this is a nice hobby, but be a doctor. <laughs> I think I was very, very fortunate in the sense that my entire family is very artistic and have all made a living out of very alternative career choices. What so is your dad doing? My dad, he, is, he does do some wildlife film and he's a photographer. But above that, he has a Broadway show where he makes music out of trash and other found objects, which is as alternative <laughs> as I think it gets, which is why when I said, oh, I want to be a marine biologist, that in my family was like, that's the most normal career I could have picked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. pick this one. This is like a safe thing to <laughs> the do. The most stable uh, one. Don't yeah. make music with trash. <laughs> uh, okay. Interesting. What, what do we see here? Is that you in the, f in the picture? No, that's not me in the photo, but I did take this picture. So this was actually during an expedition with the Waterman Project, who I did some work with just after I graduated from university. And it was, um, they were trying to basically set a camera tag onto the Great Hammerhead to be able to monitor its behavior in Bimini. And it was a really just amazing opportunity to learn a little bit more about how these biologists interact with big sharks and the different methods that they can use to really understand their behavior. So there's a camera and a tag? Yeah. And where does it end up? So these camera tags normally, it depends on the type of tag you're using, but they normally pop off between 24 and 48 hours. And then when they pop off, you can then collect the tags and download all of the data. So this was just being used for scientific purposes. So you can then download all the data and it'll have information about the accelerometry. Sometimes it'll have acoustics. It'll have different biological information as well that you can combine with that footage. And then it will help these scientists just make a better understanding of how these sharks move, how they use their habitats. And then that can then be used to inform policymakers to create marine protected areas and really protect these species. We have a film, and when you send us the film, I thought like, oh yeah, cool, she's been doing a cool film, and then we're gonna show the film. And then <laughs> yesterday at dinner you told me, I really don't like the film. It's a really bad <laughs> film. I wanna, like, are you a perfectionist, or are just too shy to show it, or what? what I'm what? definitely a perfectionist, and probably also a little bit too shy to show it, so it's definitely a combination of the two. <laughs> okay, so I think we show it. But without sound, yeah. and we can talk over it. So Sounds good. what we see there, you can also relate a little bit to what we're going to see uh, there. Is this um, also about the, um, like your story? Or what is the film about? Because yeah. I, I, you've been sending it to festivals uh, yeah. and things like that. So the film is kind of about how the ocean has changed in just my lifetime. And I think for me growing up, I was always so inspired by the stories that I grew up with. So since my dad was such a passionate diver, I grew up with him telling me these amazing Cousteau stories, the things that he grew up with about this incredible ocean and abundant life and beautiful reefs. And I always used to watch him go away on these dive trips and come back with these amazing stories and hear these stories from his friends and think, oh, I can't wait until I'm old enough to be able to do those things and decided I was going to be a marine biologist and I was going to be able to make that my life, do that for life and just be able to have these incredible experiences with this incredible marine life and these amazing environments. But the reality was that <coughs> by the time I was actually graduating, those experiences didn't exist anymore in a lot of places around our world. And it's becoming harder and harder to be able to observe these things that used to be so common in our oceans due to a lack of conservation. 
So this film was kind of looking at how the oceans have changed in just my lifetime and reflecting on some of those memories that I grew up with as a child and whether or not they are still achievable and if there is still hope and trying to inspire a younger generation to not give up and show them that there's still a chance to recover our oceans if they are passionate and enthusiastic and make some small changes in their lives. How, how does it work? Like you grow up in the Reunion Islands and you have the ocean everywhere or <laughs> you grow up in the UK and you have very cold ocean. Like how did that come along? I mean, the, the, I, I, I mean, I don't want to offend everyone, but uh, the UK is probably not like the most obvious uh, place to start about, you know, the beauty of the underwater yeah. world and coral reefs and... So I grew up in Brighton. It's definitely not the best place for diving. Um, there is diving there. It's just very poor visibility and not a great location for that kind of thing. Um, I was very fortunate that I was able to travel a lot with my parents when I was younger. So I was able to see coral reefs and other things. And as well, since my mum's Jamaican, we spent a lot of time in the Caribbean when I was younger. And I was able to see some of the most stunning reefs. And it really kind of built my passion around the ocean. Um, and then when I was 18, I moved to California for university. So then once I was permanently based out in the US, I was able to have a lot more experiences, dive a lot more regularly, and really build up my hours in the ocean around some amazing marine life. Let's, let's stick to that. So you go to school. You, yeah. go, you went to school? Yeah. yeah. So you go to school like everybody else. And then after school, you know, what should I do? Then you decided to go to California and to study marine biology? Or what yeah. is it? OK. And what is it that you actually learn there and for what are you prepared because you're not going to be a, con a conservation filmmaker after you study marine biology but you study marine bi biology uh, biology because you think it's the base for everything else yeah so i always wanted to be a photographer or a filmmaker but i always mainly because i wanted to be able to share my love of the ocean and i think the photography and film is one of the best ways of doing that so for me, I was like, if I'm a marine biologist, then I'll be able to understand these creatures, be able to share their stories, and then people will love them as much as I do. And that was kind of what I always had in my head on how that would work. Um, something that's kind of important was that when I was in high school, I wasn't good at science. I was terrible in some of my science classes, but I was so... I loved the idea of being a marine biologist so much that it just didn't matter. And it was very much so like, okay, I will study those extra hours. I'll get a tutor for that class because I could see that the end goal would be so worth it if I could just push past and get an okay grade to get to that point. So since I was literally about five, I had been working towards this idea that when I was at university, I was going to be a marine biologist and study marine biology. And then I got to university and realized that my reality of what a marine biologist is is very, very different to what yeah, no, I just wanted to ask <laughs> you about a marine that. biologist yeah. is. Um, and it's a lot of lab work. It's a lot of studying. It's a lot of papers. And I think the thing that I found <coughs> most frustrating during my undergrad is that I would read these incredible papers about this fascinating behavior and amazing scientists. But then I would kind of look at them and go, well, why doesn't everybody else know this? If everybody else knows this, then we wouldn't have a problem and everyone would be conserving these species. And I think that there's just a problem with the way that science works in the format that you have a marine biologist, they go out, they do some incredible research, they collect that data, analyze that data, publish it into a paper, and then it sits on a shelf for another marine biologist to pick up, to then go, oh, okay, so they found out this, <coughs> now I'll build on their research. So you end up with this incredible wealth of knowledge, but it's very isolated from the general public. And that was why I was kind of was like, well, I've always loved photography. I've always loved film. Why not combine these two things that I'm so passionate about and be able to take my science and make it more accessible? So even during my undergraduate, all of my kind of lab experiments, I would vlog. And it was kind of like giving people that insight into, oh, so this is how we actually do things. This is what a day in the life of a marine biologist really is. And I think that the, just being able to build that audience with people was hugely beneficial. And it just went to show that if I could do this on a bigger scale, maybe I could actually have a conservation impact. So you're not going to have a lack of story opportunities because there's so many things on the shelf that are interesting to yeah. you know, reveal to a, a, a broader public. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> if we can conclude on that part, you went into marine biology, it wasn't as cool as you thought it's going to be, and then you realized, hey, making films about it would be actually super cool. 
I think for me, it's always been about combining the two. So even as a filmmaker, I'm never really stepping away from being a marine biologist. Um, I think the term marine biologist, obviously, it gets shifted around a lot. Like I personally think marine biologist is anyone who studies the ocean and tries to share knowledge of the ocean. Some people think that you have to have a PhD and you have to be studying it to that level. But actually, sometimes those smaller studies are just as important if you can educate people and raise the awareness. So it's a, it's a bit of a tricky one. But I think for me, I'll always kind of navigate a film thinking of it in terms of the science and what is the main message that I want to convey and what's the most impactful way of doing that. And if I just was to give a report on a study, people wouldn't be as interested. Whereas if I can connect an emotional story to it, like, so this film was more kind of based around, it's based around this idea of shifting baselines, which is the idea that fish stocks are declining at such a rate, but we don't notice them because of the separation of generations, which is actually quite a complex scientific theory. But by putting it into just my own lifetime, and the relationship between my dad and me and my children in the future, it becomes something that's really relatable and people can grasp these bigger scientific concepts. Pretty smart. <laughs> Pretty cool. Uh, if you study marine biology and you have your degree, what do you usually do then after that as a job? If you not have brilliant idea to become a filmmaker? There's a whole mix of things that you can do. I have friends that work in fishery management. I have friends that work for kind of like local government organizations, helping them to better understand their local waters, what's impacting them. Um, you can do also just studying of behavior and studying of the development of different reefs and ecosystems. So there's all sorts of different areas of research. For me, conservation has always been the most interesting one. So there's also some fantastic work going on in coral reef restoration which is something that I'm really passionate about and I think it's a really interesting area of marine biology. So there's a huge variety of jobs available. Um, I think you have to really, you have to search for them. There's definitely more marine biologists out there than there are. There, there is work that's really appealing, I think. A lot of marine biology work will be sitting in a lab and doing a lot of analysis, which isn't what people imagine. So you've been out in the field You are a young girl, like from your very personal perspective, what is the, what is the worst problem that we're facing right now? It's a really tricky one. I think like the most, the biggest problem that's visible and that you can easily see would be pollution. But I actually think one of the biggest problems is overfishing and it's not understanding the resource that we have. And I think what people often forget is this relationship between fish and our reefs which I think is really interesting. So we talk about ocean acidification and we talk about coral bleaching, but we don't talk about it in relation to the fish. And actually, if you have a reef that's completely bleached and you have no fish in the area, bringing back those corals won't work because you end up with just an algal dominated reef because you've lost all the herbivores. So you have to look at things in a, from a much broader perspective and go, okay, so what are the root causes here? And then think of them from a socioeconomic perspective. So going, not just saying, oh, you can't fish this, but instead talking to the locals, talking to people who are impacted by it, and gaining a better understanding of what's the best way to actually address these issues on a bigger scale. But I think, yeah, overfishing is definitely a huge problem. And after, after understanding about it, is, is your job then to address the issue or also to find uh, solutions for it? As a marine biologist or as a filmmaker? Both. Both? <laughs> so I think as a marine biologist, you def it becomes a little, I don't know, people have different views as to what you should be doing as a marine biologist. I think a lot of people think that it's the job of the marine biologist to find out about it and to just research it and understand it. I think it has to be taken that step further to public awareness and to education. Um, which a lot of marine biologists do do, and I think is becoming more and more common to include that educational step. As a filmmaker, I think awareness is the most key part. But you can't just tell people about the problem. You have to also look at how you can make it an emotive response as well. So making people care about the environment as well as educating them about the problem. So with a problem like overfishing, you wouldn't want to just tell the audience overfishing is a problem, you need to make them love the ocean first. And that's where it becomes quite interesting. You brought a few photos from the things that you've been doing, because I think there is like 
two parts uh, to the talk. One is what happened until now. Yeah. And the other one is what happens in the future because you're working on some interesting, really cool projects. But why did you send us this photo? So this was actually one of my first big field expeditions, which was a really, really is amazing that, experience for me. It looks like Guadalupe, no? So this is Revy, so just by Socorro. Oh, yeah. And this ah, was okay. with the Waterman Project, which was an amazing team that I was really lucky to be involved with. And um, yeah, William and Lucas ended up being like two of my greatest mentors and kind of helping with my career. And it was a fantastic expedition. And we were basically in Revy to tag scalloped hammerheads. But it was in that experience that I really got to have an opportunity to play with cameras and play with sharing those conservation stories. So I was doing little vlogs while I was there about the project and <coughs> helping with photos of the sharks to ID them, but then also just doing a lot of um, just these little videos that would show people this is the reality of a day on an expedition like this and what really goes into that kind of work. And it was a really fun project and led to more things. How did you great. tag scalloped hammerheads? I personally am not the person to be doing that. Um, William Winram is a fantastic free diver and an incredible um, sp uh, spear fisherman, I think is the right word. <laughs> um, and he has a modified spear gun, which has a satellite tag attached. And he would have this ability to dive down to incredible depths and line it up perfectly and seem to tag the sharks with incredible precision that I would never understand. Free diving into the cloud of Sharks, yeah. picking out a shark, Jeez. shooting a gun to but attach a tag. But not just picking out a shark, picking out the female that is the correct size because that's what's required for the biological survey and like an amazing cool. talent. Amazing. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> what about this friend here? So this is a great white shark, obviously, but the reason that I took this photo and why I really liked it is because of the little pilot fish. Oh. And, <laughs> and I just thought that it's this really kind of, you get this shark that looks so kind of brutish and a sca almost scary in this picture, and he's just covered in scars. But the little pilot fish hangs just in front of his teeth. And what was interesting to me is that it shows this really interesting relationship between these two species. And that was something I really always enjoyed from a marine biology perspective, was this relationship between species. So the little pilot fish will kind of dart in between their teeth, eating all of the ah, just stuff that's because there. Because I always <laughs> wanted to ask this question. Like, is, this, <laughs> is, is the shark always thinking like, one day, bro, I'm going to get you? Right. Or is he like <laughs> taking care of him because he knows he's his toothbrush? Yeah, so it seems as though there's a little bit of a mutual relationship between them. I have no idea if sometimes he just gets too hungry and is just like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat this one. But it <laughs> seems like because of this relationship, they do tend to keep them around because it is beneficial to the sharks and it's healthier for the sharks. But uh, wait a second, can everybody yeah. see it? Because I'm th I think you sit in front of your little friend there. <laughs> if you move a little bit yeah. to the right so that everybody can actually, little yeah. pilot actually fish. see so it. This is ah, my okay. little pilot fish. One of the things I've always wondered but haven't been able to figure out is where they go when the great whites breach. And I've always That's wondered if one. like the great white jumps out the water and the pilot fish is just like, oh, wait for me. <laughs> or does he just like hang <laughs> out below? <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's something about the two of them that I've always found really amusing. And I always love seeing pilot fish <coughs> with, with big apex predators. <laughs> is it true that they usually like kind of surf on the, on the pressure wave of the, of the shark? I'm not sure. Yeah. I don't know. The uh, yeah? science says something like that because they're detecting the movement with their lateral lines. So if the shark is turning right, the pilot fish already knows that it's going to turn right. So, so they're cool. just lazy guys <laughs> Pretty much. taking a ride. And they just don't want to die. Yeah, and that. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, a, good, that's, that's your protection. bodyguard. <laughs> that's a good point. I think one of my other things, there's a, it's an old wives' tale, so whether or not there's any truth in it, I don't know. But um, there's reports from shark fishermen that after they caught sharks, pilot fish trailed the, um, followed the boats for hours because they're so loyal to their sharks, which I always thought was really heartbreaking, and the idea of like a little pilot fish just Oh, they're just like super friend. angry. <laughs> like you took, back my yeah. friend. Took, you took away my taxi. <laughs> <laughs> so that's you. That is me. Oh, amazing uh, freediving <laughs> performance. Mm -hmm. What are you actually photographing? Um, so I was, this was when we were in Revy. So this photo was actually taken by Lucas Mueller. Um, He's a fantastic photographer, and it was just a really, um, we were just, I was filming. So I was filming more and more footage to kind of cut together with the vlogs that I was doing. 
So we were doing, um, I would kind of like interview everyone each night and find out about how the research was going for them, what they were hoping to achieve the next day, and kind of just doing an overview of the expedition day by day. But obviously, to edit that, I needed lots of cutaways. So I was just filming the reef and filming some of the beautiful sights of Socorro. Just another day in the office. <laughs> no big deal. No big deal. Why did you send this one? So this one is a, it's a great white again. But the, what I like about this photo is that it's kind of the perfect position for an ID. So mm -hmm. whenever I'm taking photos, if I can also take them for a conservation value, then I'll always try and take profile style photos. So this would mean that I can then compare the shark to a big database of all the different catalog sharks in Guadeloupe and be able to determine exactly which one that is. And that's really inter interesting for the scientific value, because when you can start building up these big maps of where people take photos of each individual, you can start to understand how they're migrating, how they're using different areas. And, and how yeah. do you identify them? By the fin? So you identify them based on the counter shading. So you can see on the Great White that the top half is that dark gray, and the bottom is white. And that's actually because it's, um, it makes them work better as a predator, because it means if you look up, they're lighter, so they blend in more against the, um, the surface. And then looking down, they're also darker. So it helps them as a predator. But it also creates these really unique lines that go down the side of the shark. So there will be no other great white other than this one that has that specific pattern. And that means that you can look at each one and go, OK, this is a different individual. Ah, OK, interesting. So that's the f shark fingerprint yeah. on yeah. the side. Ah, OK. Yeah, I always thought it's the fins, but obviously the fins get bitten and change yeah, a lot. Yeah, so some people do use fins and things for IDing, but the problem is is that they heal, and you, they get different scrapes and different markings all the time. So the counter shading is one of the most reliable ways to be able to keep looking back at them and know that this is the same one. Because you could see the same shark the following year, and it could have half of its fin missing due to all sorts of problems. And then you wouldn't know it's the same shark unless you had this pattern. Makes total sense. Are you uh, filming and shooting this um, out of a cage or out of uh, in a cage? Or? I was in a cage. Yeah, I would love to one day be out of a cage, but um, <laughs> yeah, this was definitely inside a cage. <laughs> Do you think it's a big deal to actually be out of a cage with a great white? I don't know. I think it's just it's one of those things where if you love sharks, the idea of being with them with nothing in between you just sounds really cool. <laughs> but um, I don't know if I would gain anything significant from being outside the cage, except that I would maybe feel a bit cooler. So in terms of, I, I personally am a fan of the cages. I think if I was outside of the cage, there would be so much more to consider and so much more to be thinking about. And if I want to just be able to focus on photography, a cage is an amazing system because you can be there and you can focus 100% of your time onto your camera instead of thinking about the animals around you. And I also get concerned sometimes that as being out of the cage is becoming more and more of this amazing idea that we're going to end up with someone doing something irresponsible exactly. and then potentially getting hurt. And in that case, you can ruin this entire industry for thousands of people just because one person's interaction. So I would love to be out of the cage, but only really if there was a reason for doing it. So I think if it was for filming of a project where it made sense to be outside of the cage, or for a research project where it made more sense to be outside of the cage, that's when I would do it. I wouldn't get out just for the fun of it. Ah, this one, I like this one, because this yeah. one has your tattoo on the side. <laughs> I forgot yeah. about that. Custom made. <laughs> That was because um, I was actually sending it to an artist to do, because they were doing some work from it. And it was just to put a watermark on it so that I could keep track of it. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you send this one? Because um, she saw it on my Instagram and asked if she could have a copy of it. Because this is like just a very beautiful photo. Uh, also out of the yeah. uh, in the cage. <laughs> in the cage, right? Hmm? In the cage. This one was taken in, yes, in, in the, the cage. cage. OK. Yeah, we've been seeing this one before. This is the camera tag. Yeah. Uh, and this is, uh, do you sometimes feel like, nah, now I'm not in the action there uh, anymore, but I'm like just documenting everything? Because we ask this kind of question to uh, every filmmaker. Do you feel you're less connected to your environment because you have a camera in front of your face? <sighs> I think it's a re it really depends on what I'm doing. I think if, it's, if I'm doing research as well, 
then you kind of you can't be too disconnected with the camera, in which case the camera is literally just documenting what's happening while I'm focused on other things as well. But I think for me to make the best images I can, I have to be in the moment because I think it's reading those behaviors and seeing those interactions that allows me to get the best images. So like with that great white and the little pilot fish, it was from really observing that interaction and understanding the two species that I saw value in the relationship between the two of them. <coughs> and I think if I was just focused on my camera and just focused on my settings and documenting, I'd probably miss those little moments that I think are quite special. But I mean, the camera is always in between, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not just like, here I am, I'm a human, you're a shark, how is it going? It's always about Get finding something, yeah. doing something. I think it's one, of those, it's one of those ones where I think that if I'm without my camera, because I love photography so much, I will still be framing up a shot in my head and I would just be going, oh, I wish I could get a photo of that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it would almost ruin I, it for me. Yeah. I always hope it's a shitty dive. Yeah. When I, don't I genuinely do. I, see, I go on a dive without my camera and I just go, I hope you don't see anything. Yeah. And it's, it's that's really not bad. the way it yeah, should yeah. be. Time for a question. As a beginner diver, Marie is asking, uh, what is this thing? Less than 30 dives, around 30 dives? About 30 I was in love with marine life. I started taking videos with my GoPro Hero 7. Here's my question. Do you recommend any specific course or training program to get the core basics of underwater filming and video editing? I think for video, for filming and editing at that stage, then I would 100% rely on YouTube. I think there's such an amazing wealth of different tutorials that are on YouTube that I have found so beneficial. Um, if you want to do, there are more formal courses that are great, but um, I don't know if you have I'm just looking for Vanessa because Vanessa? she's basically the girl doing <laughs> yeah. all the video videos on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, so Vanessa does some fantastic tutorials, which I use all the time. And every time I get people asking me questions, I very often am just like, oh, go look at Vanessa. <laughs> like, this will explain it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that YouTube's a really good one because you can search for really specific problems. And especially if you're at that beginner level, sometimes sitting through an entire course isn't really what you need. It's little questions that you have on how do I get a more stable shot? What's the best picture profile? What's the best thing to do with my coloring? And on YouTube, I feel like there's not just a huge variety, but there's camera specific tutorials as well, which is really helpful because what works for one camera might not work for another. And the same with if you're using different editing software. So you can very easily just type in like, oh, if I'm using Premiere Pro, how do I do this type of cut? And there'll be a hundred different courses and yeah. I also think, Marie, if you're watching, you're in a beautiful position because you are a beginner. You have everything in front of you. I would say don't, you know, don't look too much uh, th uh, you know, at things that other people do. You know, just go out there and experiment. And if you, you know, get to some of your own limitations, then try to figure out why and you might end up somewhere completely unique. So tutorials, great. Manuals, great. But in the end, just go out there and shoot things and find your own way. Uh, very philosophical. <laughs> Stefania is asking, which beginner editing program do you recommend for underwater videos? What are you editing on? So I started off editing on iMovie, like most people, because it's free and it comes on the laptop. And it's great for if you just want to do really quick cuts of your little holiday videos and things. And then I moved on to Final Cut and spent a while on Final Cut because it was really similar to iMovie. And I'd already figured out iMovie. But I actually now use um, um, Adobe Premiere. And the reason that I really like Premiere over all of the other programs is because of how much there is online to support you on Premiere. So I found that there's, it's such a popular system that there are so many different effects, and it works really well with other programs I was using already. So I was already using Lightroom a lot to edit my photos, and I just found that it's really easy to create LUTs that I can then apply to my videos, and they just worked really well hand in hand. So I personally would recommend Adobe Premiere, and then just check out some of the videos that are online, and they will guide you through it step by step. You're one of the rare species who's used both Final Cut and I know, Adobe. I've jumped around yeah. so Do you know much? that the, the both softwares were actually developed by the same person? What? No. Yeah. No. Fun no. fact on the side. <laughs> like completely different user interface, completely yeah. different thing. But this one yeah. guy, I forgot the name, but who was developing both of the softwares. Interesting. Yeah. And he's created two separate independent groups of supporters. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, 
let's talk about what you're actually doing now. The photo doesn't really fit to that. We just <laughs> went on a trip together. We shot some photos, having fun in the Red Sea, doing really serious, you know, scientific work now. <laughs> it sometimes looks like that. This is the most scientific. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What are you working on now? Nobody's watching. We're totally confidential. Like, you can just, you know, get it out there. So I literally, technically, I think I'm still a student. But I have just finished my master's in wildlife filmmaking, which was a really fantastic course that I was really lucky to be able to do. And it was a year-long master's that basically kind of took people that had a background in sciences and then kind of really showed them the art of storytelling and how you can create natural history documentaries. So I did that course, which was brilliant. And it was run in part with the natural history unit in the BBC. So it was kind of with the guidance of some of those incredible industry professionals that I was able to really gain an understanding on what goes into making these natural history documentaries and produce my own film. How, do, how, how can you sign up for that? Like so you, you have to have study marine biology before and then... You, you have that? to have a bachelor's degree in a science subject, ideally. However, you can also apply from other backgrounds. I think science is just preferred. So there are a few of my friends, they have backgrounds in business. And it's actually really interesting because they just come into it with such a different perspective. And I think that's something that's really good for natural history is to have this kind of medley of people that all have different backgrounds and different understandings of what works for them because it makes for a much more interesting final result. So it's a, um, it's a university course. It's run by the University of the West of England. Is that a BBC thing? So the University of the West of England is an entirely separate university, but they basically partnered with the BBC to develop this program. So the BBC Natural History Unit is kind of a partner on this project. So what, what that meant was that every Monday, my classes would be at the BBC, and you would have some of the best camera operators, directors, producers, editors come and basically give you a masterclass every week on this is how you do each of these things which is an amazing wealth of knowledge to have access to, which is why I recommend the course so highly. And then as well as that, you get assigned a mentor to guide you through your entire production. So I was really lucky to actually have one of the directors from Blue Planet mentor me on my student project, which seems crazy, but that's how good the program is. And um, I learned so much from doing that course. And it was because of that that I was then able to get my job that I'm doing now as a researcher um, for a new production company. And how long was the master degree? The course is a year. One yeah, year. one year. Sounds pretty cool. You still didn't tell us what you're doing right now. <laughs> she <laughs> carefully went around and yeah. didn't answer. So I'm currently working as a researcher for Wild Space Productions, which is a new production company. And we've just started making a new, seri a new very big series about oceans for Netflix. Um, and that's all I can say. <laughs> that's all I could say. But, but it's when, exciting. When are we going to see that on Netflix? Um, not for a good three to four years. So Ooh. it's a big, long-term production, but it's a really exciting project. Is it frustrating? I think it, there is an, an element of frustration because I think you come across stuff and you get so excited about it and you want to be able to tell everyone and show everyone what you've seen. But I think that at the same time, there's a luxury in having this amount of time because no idea seems too ambitious. And it means that you can really go, wouldn't it be incredible if I could film this? and then build these amazing networks of scientists and filmmakers and camera operators to make that a reality, which is really exciting. <laughs> cool. Hamnan can't wait to ask a few community questions, yeah. I guess. There's, um, the questions have been coming in two different streams, okay. so I'll let you answer both of them. The first set of questions, and they both are asking you for advice. So the first set is for people, you have a background, uh, you did a master's in filmmaking. Yeah. But for someone who doesn't have that background, mm -hmm. how do you get into this field? So that's one set of people who are asking you questions. And the other set are people who already are in conservation filmmaking, okay. but they're having a lot of issues, especially trying to make a living out of it. Um, some of the things I've been seeing from those set of people is that they can sometimes cover costs, but not always. And so you can't really make much money on it. So what advice would you give both these streams of people? <laughs> okay, so we've got a one half of people don't have a background in filmmaking, but they do want to be filmmakers? Yes. Okay, so for them, I think that something that I thought was really fantastic with the course is that it kind of showed me what I can do with quite limited resources. And it, 
anyone can go out and actually start producing a film. And I was able to fundraise almost my entire film just by doing a GoFundMe. And my GoFundMe was literally just me talking to camera, talking about why I love the oceans and what I was hoping to do. And amazingly, I was able to generate support just by doing that. And then through that as well, I was able to partner with dive companies, with scientists who were willing to give me some like, massively discounted dives, some free dives. They were willing to get all of their staff to sit down and do interviews because there was kind of like a mutual benefit. They get some kind of free video that helps them promote their company or they get exposure on social media for their company. And I get the opportunity to try making a film. So it meant that like, for doing my student film, like, I did everything. So I was filming, I was editing, interviewing. Um, color grading. Yeah. I even worked with some student composers who were fantastic to write the score. And it kind of gave me like this broad idea of all the different elements that go into making a film. But you don't need a course to do that. Yeah. Anyone can go and have an idea and just start making something. And I think you'll be surprised by how much support there is out there yeah. for a young person that's passionate and wants to do something for the right reasons. Hmm. Be nice. Be connect. <laughs> yeah. 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 And invest time and effort. And then the other people wanted to know... The people who are already <laughs> in already this field makers, somewhat. But they're struggling to make enough money. Yeah. Yeah, it's a hard one. Is it <laughs> I no, think really hard one. It's, I it always, really starting out, I, when I used to do bits of kind of freelance camera work, absolutely, I would never make enough money to pay rent. And that was why I had a hundred other jobs on the side. So I was a dive instructor for a while. I taught photography for a while. I used to sell photos of people diving. That was one of the best ones because it meant that I could continue to build up my portfolio underwater yeah, that's true. and I could sell images back to people. So that's one that I really <laughs> recommend if you're, yeah, if you're yeah. in the industry and you just want more time in the water but you can't afford it, then take photos of the discover scuba guy. divers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, working yeah. night shift in a factory is also very efficient. <laughs> that's yeah. what I did when I was young. <laughs> yeah. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Yeah. Do you have another one? No, I think that covers most okay, of the, perfect. The, the themes. Inka, very inspiring and a very different insight uh, on something like this. Thank you very much. Thanks. And in case you thought you get away with us not singing for oh, you, we just we thought we're not going to sing now. <laughs> it's an inside thing. We always think happy, happy birthday to her because uh, she just... She's just so embarrassed by it, and she's so... Uh, okay, yeah. I don't know, guys. Happy birthday. Now, come on, Tim. We do that tomorrow on the party with, like, everybody there, and then... Yeah, exactly. So don't miss out the party uh, tomorrow, uh, Saturday, here on the stage. Inka will, of course, be around social media, you know, fiddle around with the yeah. comments, ask, uh, answer the, the questions and everything. Um, and we will make a break for 15 minutes, right? Where is uh, Sonia? What are we going to do today? Seacam will be on the stage talking about their latest innovations, underwater housing, high-end manufacturer with the silver, super slick, nice-looking housings. We have the guys over here. Um, Vanessa will talk to them uh, about what's going on. And then at 2 o'clock, we have a chat with Luke Inman. The last time with the Skype uh, check up with him, he was sitting there in his boxer shorts with his <laughs> cats. So we're going to see what's going to be like that. Yeah. And after that, uh, 3.30, we're going to have Evan Sherman here talking about creative macro lighting. So we're out for now. Inka, good luck and <laughs> just keep going. Can't go wrong. <laughs> See you later, guys, in 15 minutes. <laughs>